Did you figure it out? You guys know what we're going to talk about? No. no. How about you guys at home? Earthquakes! Right. And what else? Volcanoes! Hi, I'm Dave Bender with... Gail. Tessa. Lanier. Mandy. Crystal. Chanel. And today we've got a fantastic steamy subject to talk about. In fact, we're talking about the Earth. And the Earth isn't something that just kind of lumbers along and orbits around the sun. No, it's something that's got activity under the ocean. It's got activity under the surface. And a lot of times we can't see that activity unless we want to do this. Earth surgery. Now to understand why the land shifts and mountains erupt, we have to know what the Earth is made of. The Earth's crust varies from about four miles thick under the oceans to 37 miles thick under the continents. As we cut further down into the Earth, we come to the mantle. The mantle is a very hot rock, 1,800 miles thick. And finally, as we travel to the middle or center of the Earth, we come to the core. Here, the material, now we believe it's iron, is so hot that it's actually in liquid form. Now, the mantle is what we're really interested in because this is where volcanic eruptions take place. And we really can't learn about volcanoes until we find out about our trip that several of us made all the way to the Clear Lake volcanic fields. All right, guys, we are here at Clear Lake, California, and why do you think we're here, huh? Water skiing. Nope. Fishing? Nope. Sunbathing? No! Volcanoes! Can you find one? Over there? That's it, right over there. That's Mount Kanaktai. And believe it or not, we are sitting on top of one of the youngest volcanic fields in California. Oh. And they're two million years old, just a baby as far as volcano fields go. How old do you think that volcano is right over there? 10,000? 20,000? 350 to 400,000 years old. Just a mere teenager as far as oh. volcanoes go. Did you also know that we are standing on something that is red hot? Oh, no, but it's not right here. It's about 15 kilometers down. It's called a magma bed, not made by Sergal. Oh. It is this flow of goopy kind of rock, and it goes right over there into Mount Kanakta, which is a composite dome volcano. And inside there, you have silica, which is also sort of a thickening agent to the magma. You can think about it this way. If you boil water or oatmeal, what's more explosive? <laughs> you got it, the oatmeal. It has a bigger pop. The more silica you have, the bigger the bang you get. And it's called a composite dome because what's the shape? Eh, dome. And composites because it has a series of layers on it. The other types of volcanoes that you can find throughout the world are shield volcanoes, which have that orange kind of goopy substance coming out of them. What do you call that? Lava. Yeah, and they'll find uh, that maybe around Mount Kilauea. And the other type is called a cinder cone. <laughs> what we're looking at here is part of a cinder cone volcano. In fact, we are inside a cinder cone volcano right now. It's 10,000 years old, it's a youngster. But what they've done here is they've cut this away because they're mining this stone. And what you can do is look up there and you can see the different layers or the layers of cinder that have fallen down. Whole volcano is basically made of this light porous material. In fact, pick one up. These are the chunks of rock that fly out when the volcano erupts. And they're so light and airy that they're filled with gas. They don't have a lot of silicate in them, so that's why they don't come out in real thick, flowy type form. Now, when these come out, you can imagine what that would be like if it was red hot and hit in the head. It would not be, a, not be a fun thing to have happen. What we have here are what they call as volcanic bombs. Chunks like this would actually fly out of the volcano. This is a baby bomb. This is a middle-sized bomb. You can imagine what a big bomb would be like. Could they blow up? No, they wouldn't blow up. What they would do is come out all red hot, all molten, and when they spin, you know how that kind of like taffy kind of pulls? They get kind of stretchy. That's how they get the shape. They spin, they spin, they spin. Centrifugal force pulls them out. When they hit the ground, they can crack and chunks can come off like this. Kind of makes the shape of a football, doesn't it? Oh, like a Fred Flintstone football. Yeah. I got an idea. You go deep. Set. Okay. Quick. Come on, Ben. Oh. What do you expect, man? It's a rock. Ugh. Careful, Kel. Don't step in the caldera. Nothing bad, it's just kidding. Oh. Right over there is the caldera. And looking out there, can you guys find a volcano? Right there. Yeah, it's pretty obvious, it's dead center. That is Sugarloaf Mountain. Sugarloaf Mountain caused that caldera. Now the way it works, remember we talked about uh, magma field? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, well, underneath that volcano is a magma field. And as the magma field rose to create the volcano, the whole area around it, one big circle, sort of like a bullseye, had to sink down. There's also a thing called a ring fracture that goes around that circle. And it stretches right on up over there to a thermal field where you will find geysers. Geysers are little fractures or portals in the ground where you get hot water coming out. There's also fumaroles. Fumaroles put up hot gas. It's kind of that stinky kind of gas. Sort of smells like rotten eggs. <laughs> kind of like that, Kale. No, sorry. <laughs> well, what are we walking around here? This doesn't have anything to do with volcanoes. Well, have you checked out your feet lately? No. Well, what you have here is a mixture of glass. In fact, if you look down here, it looks like glass when you pick it up, and that's the silica. In fact, this all fell and came out of the volcano almost as a big wad of glass. Also in here, you will find pumice and rhyolite. And when you mix silica and rhyolite, you get the most explosive combination or lava form. And when it comes out of the volcano, well, remember when we talked about oatmeal and how it kind of globs up oh, and bubbles? Yeah, yeah. Same thing here. It just kind of goes blah and comes out. And when it comes out, it comes out very similar to sort of a molten piece of glass or a molten, maybe like chunk of honey. Also, when you look at this flow, you'll find things like right here. Here's a piece of it. This is obsidian. Yeah. What do you think you'd use obsidian for if you were an arrowhead? Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you knew the question, didn't you? Yeah, you'd use it for an arrowhead. And around here, over the last couple of thousand years, this is a pretty good spot to find material to make an arrowhead. All right, besides getting a free trip to the lake and enjoying this great sunshine, did you learn anything today? Yeah. All right. But how can you tell the difference between a mountain and a volcano? <laughs> Good question. You cannot always tell if it's a mountain or a volcano. Now, Kanaka over here, you can kind of tell by the shape that that's a volcano. Some of the other mountains around Clear Lake are volcanoes as well, but the only way you can really tell is to get up close to the mountain itself and check out the rocks. What is it like to be in a real eruption? That's a good question. I don't know, but I think it's kind of like that. Let's get out of here. <laughs> All right, it's just TV, but we're going to show you a real eruption coming up next. It's just great balls of fire. All right, it's experiment time. We got a little sand here. Excited, huh? All right, we got a little baking soda. Since you're excited, put that in there, my friend. We're making a volcano. All right. All right. Now we need a little bit of vinegar. We'll pour that in here. And what else do we need? We need something colorful. You got it. Whatever. That's food coloring, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever. If it's going to make lava, what it's going to do. All right, and Chessa, do the honors. Here we go. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. All right, it's not quite a real volcano, but can you imagine the explosive force of a real volcano? Yeah. Well, one of the best kept records of a volcano was in 1980 when Mount St. Helen erupted. Look at this. Say it's lunchtime. You're hungry and you decide on soup. Now you start heating up that soup, and if the heat's just a little high, bubbles form on the surface, ready to pop. Now imagine one great big bubble on an active volcano, and you'd have a pretty good idea what was going to happen to Mount St. Helens back on May 18, 1980. Just like the heat from the stove causes the soup to boil, magma, or hot, molten rock within the mountain caused a bulge to form on the side of Mount St. Helens. Then, on May 18th, the earth rumbled as a 5.0 earthquake shook the mountain. The quake triggered an avalanche on the northern face of Mount St. Helens. The shaking ground and avalanche were too much for the growing bulge. It burst with a lateral blast of ash, rock, and lava. Then, that was followed by a vertical eruption sending ash over three states. As the north side of the mountain gave way, rivers of mud and debris gobbled up everything in its path. The avalanche-filled rivers crashed through forests and threatened people and buildings. Mount St. Helens was no longer a symmetrical mountain rising over 9,600 feet into the air. The volcano lost almost 1,500 feet as a crater replaced its cone-shaped top. But the crater wouldn't remain a gaping hole for long. New eruptions within the crater have left a pile of volcanic material that's creating a new lava dome. Now we know what a volcano can do. Now we have to figure out why in the world a volcano will form where it does. Well, the answer is plate tectonics. Plates help us to figure out what the Earth actually looks like, where the continents are going to be, where valleys are, what happens underneath the ocean, things like that. And a way to figure that out, at least get an idea what it might look like, i kind of hold that up there, Kale. See that? 
Those are like the individual plates that are on the Earth. There's some 20 of them that are on the Earth. They are like 60 miles thick, and they go all around what they call as the lithosphere. So when you see little edges like that, those are kind of like plates. Maybe to give you a better view, we put some styrofoam in water here, and who's got a crystal? Mandeep, you guys have some straws? Just kind of get in there. I know you don't, you're not supposed to do this at home, but blow bubbles in the water. See, now see the way they move just like that? That's like the mantle of the Earth making these plates move around, and they bounce together. Now, an example of this happens in California, where the plates will be moving. You have two plates. You've got the North American plate, and you've got the Pacific plate, and they're moving in opposite directions. And believe it or not, in the distant future, you're going to find Los Angeles next to San Francisco. Why? Because the plates are constantly moving. Now, these type of plates can move in three different ways. And one way, we'll demonstrate it here with Plato, is called subduction. One plate will want to go under the other, and as it goes under, it gets down toward that mantle and starts heating up and becomes liquid, and then it gets hot right along there. What do you think forms? Volcanoes! That's right. In fact, Mount Kilauea formed this way. Also, Mount Lassen and Mount Kanaktai formed this way. And when they formed, they originally were underwater. Now, another way plates will move away from each other or move together is called a divergent boundary. Actually, they're actually moving away. You can see it here on this roll. See the way one side went that way and went that way? Mm -hmm. That's how they create ground. It's like the ocean floor. Now, the third way the boundaries move, in fact, we can all do this. Put your hands together, move them back and forth. It's like two boundaries going back and forth. It's called strike slip. One idea on how these plates move is called convection currents. We talked a little bit about the mantles being all this red hot stuff. Well, you know, heat rises and cold air wants to go down or cool wants to go down. So let's add a couple of drops in here and see if this works. Well, you see the cold is dropping down and you notice it starts to curve a little bit. And then we'll see a little bit of rising there as the heat wants to bring it back up. Cool. Just try paint. Well, that looks like paint there, but the concept is you have hot and cold going up and down, thus helping to move the plates around. Let's try a little bit. We'll just drop a little bit of sawdust in here and see if the same thing happens. Some of it should drop. It'll go down. And as the heat starts rising again, it should bubble itself back up. That helps to move the plates. That's one way scientists feel it works. Now, the second theory on how these plates move is gravity. And we're going to do a little gravity experiment here. When you guys have done an experiment with gravity, you jump up and down, what happens? You fall! You fall back down. Okay, same concept here. This is a tectonic plate. This is the mantle, and we lay this in here. Watch the edges. The edges will start to fall down first. Mm -hmm. Thus, as they go down, new material comes up. Gravity makes the plates move. Now, we know that we live on these plates, these big rocks. Yeah. Yeah. And what happens when they bounce together? What do you think you get? Earthquake! That's right, and we are going to experience an earthquake up close in San Francisco, coming up after the break. All right, we're here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. What do you guys think, huh? Cool! It's beautiful up here. Any idea how these mountains were formed? Earthquake? Good answer. It goes with the show, too. They were formed along little faults, little thrust faults off the main fault, which is the San Andreas Fault, the granddaddy of them all. What we can see is a little chunk of the fault, right down to, see way out there? Mount Loma Prieta. But it goes further south than that. Any idea how far south it may go? Baja, California? Que bueno! Good answer. That's right. It goes all the way down to Old Mexico. All right. Here's a better question. What's a fault? Cracks in the earth? Yeah, cracks in the earth. They move back and forth. They shake the earth, creating the earthquakes. Would you guys like to look at a strike slip fault? Yeah! Yeah, it's the San Andreas, and it's right over there. Come on, guys. All right. This is a sag pond. Another example that we are along an active fault. Why do you think it's called a sag pond? Because it sags. Good answer. It's exactly what's going on. Remember we talked about how faults will move back and forth, and sometimes when they move, they'll buckle up, and sometimes when they move, they separate. Yeah. When they separate, you get a little bit of a dip, called a sag, and when it rains, the water fills in there, thus making a pond just like this. Well, Dave, I have one question. How, when there's water in a pond, how come the um, water doesn't rush down between the cracks? That's a good question. Well, when the earth goes back and forth with the fault, Mm -hmm. It grinds up the material in between into a fine clay. And clay's got this unique ability. When it gets any moisture on it, it, it expands and it fills the crack like a cork. Okay. Just like pushing gum down in a hole and so that the water won't come out. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's just like the caulking around your bathtub. Another prime example that we've got an active fault. Hey guys, look what I found right here. Hey Dave, why don't you come down here? No way, I know what poison oak is when I see it. Ah! Just a joke to sell down. It's not poison oak, but what you are sitting on is an oak that's kind of growing sideways. Any idea why? Because it's on the fault line, Dave. It's near the fault line, my friend. Back in 1906, big quake along the San Andreas Fault. Tree fell down. See those right there? You think those are trunks? <laughs> those are branches originally growing sideways. Now they're growing straight up. Again, proof that this is a big fault. 
Hey, look at this. This tree didn't fall sideways, but actually was twisted. Roots are on one side of the fault line and roots are on the other side of the fault line. They moved, it twisted. Whenever you study a fault, it's really important to check out the soil and the rocks around the fault. Where do you think that rock right there came from? No. No, no. no. Remember Mount Loma Prieta? We talked about it. Mm -hmm. That rock came up here 23 miles. But no one carried it. It didn't come up here in a truck and someone dumped it here. That's not the way it worked. It worked as the faults moved. Now, it happened this way. That rock was part of that mountain. Tumbled down the mountain, hopped in the stream. The stream pushed it and pushed it and pushed it until it finally crossed over to the other side of the San Andreas Fault. And then there was a big quake. The earth moved. Seven foot shift. Rock goes. Big quake, seven feet. Big quake, seven feet. Big quake, seven feet. Big quake, seven feet. It took two million years to get that rock 23 miles to there. Oh, oh wee yo. Oh, wee yo. Hey, I'm laying here right on the fault. And, ooh, did you feel that? A couple more good quakes like that, my foot will be in my mouth in about 300 years. Hey, Dave, how come half the fence is here and half the fence is there? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Dave. Yeah. How come that fence is there and how come that fence is there? We are in an active fault, right? Yeah. You want to learn how this moved? Sure. Okay, let's see. You're in position. Yeah, stand right next to her, Mandy. Okay, you guys ever done the twist? Yeah. Okay, I want you to twist about oh, a foot and a half that way and we'll do it this way. Ready, set, go. Let's do it. And stop. That's exactly what happened back in 1906 along the San Andreas Fault with the big earthquake. Now, we moved down here about three feet up towards San Francisco. It moved 16 feet whoa. during that earthquake. Yeah, whoa, we would have been twisting for days to do that. The actual earthquake itself lasted 20 seconds, and the energy as it went through the rocks traveled at 5,000 miles per hour. Wow. It was a big, big quake. Yeah. You guys want to travel a big distance to feel a quake? Uh -huh. Sure. Yeah. Let's go to San Francisco, and it's about 30 miles away. Come on. Let's go. All right, guys, we have made it. We are here at the California Academy of Sciences. You are ready to feel a quake? Yeah! Okay, we're going to do it in the safe quake room. It's right over here. And the first one we're going to do, come on out, is a 4.0 on the Richter scale. All right? So what do, what do you guys think, huh? It's weak. Weak, wimpy. All right, it's kind of like, like magic fingers, right? You put the quarter in there in the bed and it's just kind of, mm, kind of humming along, right? Let's do a little research here. These quakes are all measured on the Richter scale and their magnitudes of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and on up, all right? Uh -huh. Every time you increase one number, it goes in strength with an increase of 30 times. So we did a 4.0, now we're going to try a 5.7. That should be close to 60 times stronger than the last one. A bit, bit stronger, huh? Yeah. Well, what's going to happen to a building if it's not like your legs? Because our legs can wobble and handle this. What's going to happen to a building? Fall. These chunks are going to fall off it, right? In 1989, there was an earthquake in San Francisco that was 7.2 on the Richter scale. What do you think happened then? Everything, Everything came down. Like that, watch out! Oh! Oh, That's madness. Don't want to be living through a 5.7 quake now, do we? No. Not pretty scary. Yeah. Now, what happened there when that earth and that building started to shake can be represented with this brick, this spring, and this string, and Kale, could you show us? I just roll that up and watch Kale with the brick here. See the energy in the spring, and the brick slides. That friction is the same type of action that happens with the strike slip fault. Another type of fault is called a thrust fault. That's where you get the earth shaking and boom, something gets projected up out of the ground. Another one is the same thing. It's a thrust fault, but it happens underneath the ground, and you see no breakage, you see no reaction. It's called a blind thrust. We learned that we measure earthquakes using the Richter scale, but you also measure waves with a seismograph, and I had like five minutes, so we made a homemade seismograph with books, a ruler, a string, and a pen, and we've got Mr. Earthquake Man here, Man Deep. Hit the uh, earth here, would you? Just kind of tap it. Keep going. Harder, harder, harder. Now, no, see the movement down there? See the way that's moving along down there? That's the way you measure the energy released in an earthquake. Now, believe it or not, we have 1,000 earthquakes per day. Now most of these, yeah. if we had a thousand of the big ones, it wouldn't be a good thing. Yeah. But most of these things are little subtle shifts, we can't even feel them, but some of them are strong enough to create volcanic eruptions and other geological changes. And we're going to learn more about those other geological changes as cool science continues. Now we've all done that during the summer, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, but we showed you that video because we're still doing science here. Now what happens if you have an earthquake or a volcano under the water? You create... Waves. Waves. I heard it from you. You got it. 
different type of wave. It's called a tsunami. Now in the middle of the ocean, it looks like no big deal. But as it gets closer to the land, the water gets more shallow, it picks up more energy, and it can create incredible amounts of damage. Earthquakes can create other secondary damaging effects. The violent earth shaking breaks apart gas mains and causes fires. Landslides, mudslides, avalanches have been triggered by the shakers. And all these situations can injure and kill human beings. So Mother Nature can always get the upper hand with an earthquake or volcano. Mm -hmm. But there are a few things that we can do to be prepared for an earthquake. Before an earthquake strikes, don't hang heavy pictures, shelves, or plants over your bed. Have your parents secure tall, heavy furniture, like your bookcase, to the wall. You should have a portable battery-operated radio, wind-up clock, and an extra flashlight with extra batteries readily accessible. And don't forget that it's really smart to have a supply of water, canned food, and juices. And make sure you have one of those mechanical can openers in case you're without electricity, gas, and food for a while. Blankets and an extra set of clothes are always a good idea as well. During an earthquake, if you're indoors, get under a table or a desk or stand in a doorway. If you're outdoors, move to the open, away from buildings, walls, trees, and power lines. If you smell or hear gas escaping, open the windows and get everyone away from the building and call your gas utility company. Have your dad or mom or yourself, if you've already been taught how, shut off the gas valve at the gas meter. So we've seen earthquakes and volcanoes are nothing to mess with, but the more we know about them, the more we can respect them, and the more we can understand the power that they have. So until the next Cool Science, be safe, be smart, and we'll see you then.